50 yards and father that couldn't hear a shotgun beside the bed. So if my voice volume drops, just say, use your father's voice, okay? <laughs> Kick it right in. That's the one that I'll have to use. So. Now, uh, bring them up because Yeah, um, normally I show up with presentations and do all kinds of PowerPoints and all kinds of entertainment stuff. And today I decided not to do that. I'm just going to come and actually kind of sit with the students. And I haven't been here for a while, so I'm going to cash it down just a little bit. Turn it over to Kelly. Okay, sure. Um, <laughs> well, I want to be, you know, in the, in, and then I can like, okay. I'm Kelly. I was just elected as the upper cervical president uh, yesterday, so I don't know if it, I don't know if it, um, any, any critiques or if you want to see anyone come in, go ahead and let me know. But I'm here to announce Dr. Brooks. He has been in practice for almost 50 years, and we have, he's going to be doing a seminar, Taking Care of People. It's about the communication of chiropractic, which is very, very necessary. So if you want any more information on this, there's spots still available, and I'm going to let him take over from here. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, howdy. Nice to be here. Um, you guys are used to being lectured to quite a bit, and I just want you to know that I really prefer interaction. If I could like sit next to you and just have a chat, I'd probably be as comfortable as I am sitting up here and, and talking at you. Um, I had a lot of different insights about what I was going to say today, and, and I started in chiropractic. Hi. <laughs> Kristen Shelton, nice to see you. I started in chiropractic. I matriculated Palmer College in September of 1963. So as of last year, I'm like 50 years in the profession. So I thought, you know, today what I'm going to do is I'm not going to talk about history. I'm going to talk about the future. Anybody interested in the future? Yes. Oh, yeah. You guys are going in there. You're going to go right into the future. So there are a lot of different options and a lot of different opportunities that you have in chiropractic and where you can go with this. So. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start off with just some, some very basic stuff. Um, Kelly's already been gracious enough to mention that I do a, a weekend seminar. I've done it for 15 years, um, 16 years now. I've had over a thousand doctors and students go through the program. Um, and virtually every one of them says that I talk to their renowned practice. I use some of your material every single day. And the reason for that is I started in 19... <clears throat> I started practicing in 1970, and I practiced for three years doing segmental chiropractic, and it's pretty easy, you know, bone on nerve, pressure, pressure on that nerve affects the way the body works. So I did that for about three years, and I, I became a little disenchanted with the idea that I had to adjust somebody over and over and over again. Uh, you know, I had to adjust somebody three times a week, and of course, I had a set of green books at home, didn't read them while I was going through school, so now in the daytime, I'm adjusting people segmentally, and I'm going on and reading green books. It starts to make a great deal of sense to me that the upper cervical spine is really important. So I closed a practice. I've been seeing almost 200 patient visits a day doing segmental work for three years. Um, and the last day I was open, I saw 168 patients turn around, lock the door, walk away. Okay, so I'm one of those folks, right? People have never said that I'm necessarily sane but I am one of those people that likes to be true to myself. So just <clears throat> follow with me then a little bit of the evolution of my practice life. So I wound up at that point not practicing for 18 months, going all over the country, taking all kinds of technique courses with all kinds of people in chiropractic. So I'm the guy that's been a Mount of Aurora taking, taking seminars with Gonstead. I'm the guy that's taken the course from Michael Kale when he was alive. I'm the guy that's taken Rob Kessinger's work. I'm the guy that's taken Roy Sweat's work, Earl Pettibone's work, uh, George Goodhart's applied kinesiology. At that time, there was a guy named Nemo. I, take, I knew Clay Thompson. Fred Barge was a personal friend of mine. I mean, if you, if you talk about somebody historically in chiropractic, I either knew them or took their class. So that's who I am. That's what I'm going to just say that's going to give me the opportunity to talk a little bit about the future of chiropractic, not just the history. I'm going to do a little history, but I really want to go over that next edge. When I started practicing upper cervical, I was using 
the Thompson terminal table, the kind that you normally do segment work on, and just using the drop pieces. And I would have, you know, a person walk in the door, drop the table, adjust them, raise the table, have them go out. It was a really nice flow of things. That's how I could see a couple hundred people a day in a two-room office, in a waiting room, and adjusting them. That was it. I also had, you know, a picnic on my farm under the tree and adjusted deal. I mean, you know, these are different times than we're necessarily living in today. But I've had a lot of those experiences, but when I went up for cervical uh, and reopened 18 months after closing that practice, I used that Thompson terminal table because that's what I had for equipment and the headpiece would drop on it. So I would use a little modified drop, a cervical drop adjustment. Today it's probably a little bit similar to what a Blair adjustment would be without the torque, for example. So one of the things I'd done is I'd gone to Sherman College. I'd spent a week with Miles Sherman when he was still alive at Sherman College. I went, to Levitt, I went out to Lubbock, Texas. I spent two weeks with Bill Blair in his office. He taught me how to read stereo x-rays. So again, I have a huge background in chiropractic technically as well as philosophically. So I'm a graduate of Palmer College as my time there has gone through the paces I've been alumnus of the year, I've been president of the Alumni Association, which is kind of a big deal with 3,500 members. Only California Chiropractic Association has more members than our Alumni Association did at Palmer. So to be able to do that, I've been on a task force to evaluate the clinical education of a chiropractor. I've talked in the, in the colleges to students since about 1984. I, I talked to virtually every student in a classroom environment that graduated from Palmer from 84 to 96. So again, I just, now that's kind of who I am. So future of chiropractic is kind of the conversation. In 1978, I went back into practice and I was doing that little thumb thing. Then I got a rock drop side posture table. I was doing a toggle with a little bit of a torque, so I'm now moving into the Blair work. Then I took an orthogonal class and after I took an orthogonal class from Ralph Gregory and Nuka, I came back and I said, okay, well, you know, I'm one of those people I believe that no one can be 100% wrong. Anyone here agree with that? Chiropractic, what we do is if somebody doesn't practice the same way I do, we make them wrong. And I thought, what we don't have is we don't have a picture big enough that we can see why, how what everybody does fits into the picture. But I started doing this other cervical thing where I was first thumping people and then I was toggling and then all of a sudden I went to stationary adjusting tables and pre and post orthogonal films. And by the time I had spent the five years from 1978 to about 1984 uh, doing the upper cervical work, now I'm beginning to get proficient, right? I'm not gonna say I was good, <laughs> or mastered, I was just proficient. And so by this time what was happening because I was getting these profound results. People would come in, I'd adjust them, and it would be a miracle. And it would just be miracle after miracle. And I'd say, oh my God, how does this happen? And how can I relate this to the people I take care of? Well, I had a pretty good idea of the non-interference model in chiropractic, but what I realized is the people I took care of didn't. They didn't have a clue, right? By the time you guys are here in school, probably every one of you knows enough to have your spine adjusted the rest of your life, right? you think the public has that? No. no, they don't have that. And so in 1984, I began asking every patient on every encounter, are there any questions? So you know what happened over the next five years? The very same questions arise in virtually everybody's mind about what we do and how it relates to them. So I don't know if it was a stroke of genius or just an innocent dumb luck that I did that. But over the next five years, what happened is I began to get the questions that people would ask about what we do and was able to de develop a procedure, an office procedure, and a communication model based on the answers to those questions. So guess what started happening? People started getting it and becoming lifetime patients and going off to chiropractic school. So by 1996, I'd already had 45 of my patients go to chiropractic school. By the mid-90s, and, and sorry, by 2005, I'd had 54 patients go to chiropractic school, right? 
because people were getting it. And they were getting it because I learned how people think about what we do and how they relate to it. And how we introduce them to it, it makes a huge amount of difference in what's going to happen in their future. One of the problems we face, and this is about the future of chiropractic, is we face what I call majority consciousness. And so there's a book called The Dictionary of Cultural Literacy. Does anybody know that book? Well, the Dictionary of Cultural Literacy are the, are the words that people can kind of agree on the meaning within a certain culture. Well, subluxation ain't in there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> ain't is, but subluxation is not. So if we're using the term subluxation, one of the problems I have is if I say to Marco, you have a subluxation and you try to relate it to Kelly, she looks at you like this, like you're from another planet because she has no idea what that word means, right? If you walk up to a prospective patient and say, do you have any subluxations? Same thing, they look at you like you're an alien. So what I learned to do is I learned to communicate the subluxated spine in a completely different way. That is that an injury sometime during life tears loose ligaments and tendons of all those 24 little bones of the spine together. It leaves behind a weakness and the spine actually breaks down and locks into a stressed position. Lying down, one of the legs is longer and one's shorter. Standing up, one of the hips is higher and one's lower. Body frame is twisted or distorted. Muscles are imbalanced. Movement is abnormal. And it progresses over time because the loading of it begins to wear and tear and break down the structure. And you know what? I could stand up anybody in this room, have them turn around and see a high and low hip and body distortion. And I could turn around and just without any words, just show them what that distortion looked like. And they'd go, yeah, I get it. You see the difference? It's not the subluxation, it's that misalignment of the spine that actually you're able to communicate to people because guess what? If we go back to the evolution of technique and chiropractic, how did we start? We started with the idea that there is tension on a, on a segment and it interferes with the nerve. And if you find that tension, it's a subluxation. And if you adjust it or manipulate it or break that joint loose, that approximation, then it relieves something. Is that true? Yes, it's true. Right? This, this is an upper cervical group. Bear with me. We'll get there. But that's how we started. We started with the idea that any segment in the spine under that load can lock up and affect then the articulation of that joint and the nerve that goes out of it. And if we break it loose, guess what? The person gets better. I remember one time Sid Williams, who I also knew personally because I was a team teacher there for a while, Sid Williams said, we've got to keep the faith in what we do until we know enough to know how to correct it. And I'm going to sit here today and tell you we already know enough to know how to correct it. You may or may not like that, but we do. The problem is those people that are still segmental, and then the people that are sectionals, right? If you adjust an L4, it'll stabilize a T6. Anybody know this section idea? Because we started with every bone, and we started with sections. Then we started with the Merrick system, like the C2 is a sinus problem, and T6 is a stomach problem. Anybody with me on this part? Right? So we started segmental, then we went to sec, well, we actually went to Merrick next, then to sections. And when thermography came along, we said that thermography indicates that there's something going on in that spine where there's resistance. And that resistance and that heat from what's going on is a way to determine if there's nerve interference. Now to me that's still a fairly subjective examination because we're not really measuring the nerve, we're measuring the output of the nerve, but it's close. Right? So anybody know what the year was when thermography came into chiropractic? 1917. Dasa Evans brought it back from World War I, his galvanic skin temperature differential, and he used the galvanic skin temperature differential to begin to bring in the neurocalligraph, neurocolometer, herbiscope, okay, to where there's lots of generations available today, way down line from the original thermographic picture. But what happened when thermography came along 
is there was a break here every time there was a break somewhere else. And if you change something here, it would change where the breaks were in the whole spine. So that by 1921, HIO had come to the forefront. And by the time B.J. Palmer put in his research clinic, he took 27 x-rays of the spine to make one upper cervical adjustment. Did you know that? Do you know how many of them were stereoscopic? Eight of them were stereoscopic, and of the stereo views he took, four of, the, four of those were of the entire spine. Okay? So we've investigated the spine and how it misaligns a long time ago. This is not really brand new. My opinion is that we didn't have the information available to correct the entire spine from here until about 1982. When we got to the four basic types from Ralph Gregory in 1982, that was the first time that we could evaluate because the atlas doesn't have a disc above or below. It doesn't have facets in the back blocking it together. But basically from C2 down, the segments of the spine work like a mechanical system. The atlas sits there like a coupling between the head and the rest of the spine. And so when the spine has an injury, the atlas doesn't displace by itself. It only displaces in relationship to everything else. So when you turn somebody around and show them the high and low hip, the distortion in the body, guess what? The person is either this way or not. There's an infinite number of knots, but there's only one of these. It's almost been heresy to suggest that there's a normal position for the segments of the spine up to this point. But it's not. It's actually available to each and every one in chiropractic today. The problem we're going to have in the future of chiropractic is everyone in our profession is still in one of those developmental stages. Okay? These are developmental stages. This is acorn to sapling to oak to acorn to sapling. Okay? These are developmental stages. And we're in developmental stages in chiropractic. And for the very first time, I can sit here and say, right now, in the last three years, we actually have evidence that there is neurological detriment from measurable misalignments of the spine. Because of the phase contrast MRIs, the upright MRIs, we now have not only the vascular input and output, we have the corking effect on the cerebrospinal cord fluid that actually changes the intracranial compliance that has a hardening effect on the tissues of the brain. And you know what? We can prove it. For the very first time in our history, we don't have to just say that because we adjust an L4 and somebody's sciatic, it gets better. That was it. We can actually have direct evidence. Now, you don't have to adjust an L4 to actually relieve stress on an on a L4 nerve going down the back of a leg because if you actually correct this, it unloads L4, reestablishes center of gravity, center of motion, and now it can do what it needs to do. Not only that, but it's possible to correct a spine and have it stay corrected long periods of time. What you want is to keep your spine corrected for the rest of your life with as many adjustments as possible? No, as few adjustments as possible. You want to stay clear and open. You don't want that stress coming back in the nervous system. You don't want to have to recover from it every time that spine goes out of line again. You want it corrected and stable. And the beauty of the upper cervical work is we are another evolutionary stage. We're not the end stage, but we're another evolutionary stage. The time will come when we're evaluating each of the segments of the spine for degenerative change for osteophytes, for exostosis, for degenerative disc and joint disease. We're going to perhaps be in that place where at the end, B.J. Palmer's research clinic, when he was still HIO, anybody here know who the three doctors were that were actually doing the adjusting in that clinic? It was Lyle Sherman, Bill Blair, and Tom Elliott. Lyle Sherman, knee chest, founded Sherman College, Bill Blair, everybody knows about the Blair procedure. Tom Elliott was a founding director of NUCA. 
okay? But during that time, there were 128 forms to be filled out, intake and exit from BJ's clinic. You know why? He was measuring everything, auditory changes, visual changes, sensory changes, the neuroencephalomentipograph. He was trying to measure nerve flow. He was trying to measure everything he possibly could relative to the spine being adjusted. There's not a facility in chiropractic today that has that capability. Did you know that? Nothing today has that. And not only that, but B.J. Palmer vacationed in Hot Springs, Arkansas one time. In Hot Springs, Arkansas, they had this great physical rehabilitation center. They had these bicycles and things where people would learn to walk again. They were coming to the baths in Hot Springs, Arkansas to get the hot baths so that they could get reinvigorated, right? So if they'd been injured, they could go there, get reinvigorated, learn to walk again, learn to, learn to work out, learn to get fit, right? Guess what B.J. Palmer did? He went back to Davenport, Iowa and put in a rehab lab that looks exactly like that rehab lab did in Hot Springs, Arkansas. So I'm going to say again, we're not the end of the evolution of chiropractic yet. We're still in that process. But we're a little bit further down the chain. We're further up the chain, however you want to look at it. And it's not that the people down here are wrong. That has saved our butts for years and years, and it has created within the public an awareness of chiropractic simply from volumes of chiropractors seeing volumes of patients. You're going to hear all kinds of numbers about utilization of chiropractic. I'm going to give you some concrete ones. In 1987, I chaired a committee in the state of Oklahoma to do a public opinion and attitude survey of the population of chiropractic relative to utilization and ideology, right? In 1987, <laughs> in the rural areas of my state, 65% of the population had used a chiropractor. In the, in the urban areas, Oklahoma City and Tulsa, only 22.5%. So utilization in the country was much greater than it was in the little bit more of the city or urban population. Now, there were some questions asked. One of those was, do bones in the spine get out of place and put pressure on the nerve? You know what the answer was? 87% of the people agreed. Does that affect the way the body functions? 87 people, 87% of the people agreed. Now, because I was on that committee, one of the questions I threw in there, you'll love this one, is there a life force necessary to maintain wellness? You know what? 71% of the population of Oklahoma agree. Isn't that crazy? Now our survey company, however, had a really good idea. And you know what that idea was? They surveyed the chiropractors to see what they thought the people would think. The chiropractors only believed that 40% of the people would agree that bones in the spine get out of place and affect nerves. They said only 20% of the people would agree that there's a life force necessary to maintain. Do you know where the problem was? We were insulting the intelligence of the people. And so when we asked the question, how many of you have an adequate knowledge or understanding of chiropractic, you know what the percentage was? Of all the people that go and went to the chiropractor, how many have an adequate knowledge or understanding? It was 11%. Because if somebody goes to you and you practice different than you and your patients talk, you know what? They can't communicate. They can't use that damn subluxation word. You know what I'm saying? And so the idea is to find a way not only to communicate what we do, but now the bigger piece. The bigger piece is how do you integrate that into someone's life? How do you take care of people in a way that allows them to choose to keep their spine corrected for as long as they live. How do you do that? That, then, is a whole other question. Because you're going to walk into majority consciousness. You are going to be blessed with ignorance. You're going to be embarrassed. You're going to be humiliated. You know? I was at a workshop last weekend in Oregon that had nothing to do with chiropractic. 
workshop leader when she knew that I was a chiropractor. I touched her on the shoulder and she says, oh, you just cracked my back. That's the current cultural understanding of what we do. Now, was she interested in learning more about what we need? No. Am I going to volunteer? No. I'm going to wait until she asks, but by who I am as a human being, I'm going to probably call them in question. Anybody follow that? <clears throat> so the idea here is if you have the skill sets to actually communicate effectively what we do, the other half of that is if somebody sits down next to me on an airplane and says, what do you do? Right? And I say, I'm a chiropractor, I've been in practice for 42 years. Really? I had this pain in my shoulder. And I say, really? There's three nerves out of the neck that go into the arm. The first one goes to the shoulder and down the outside to these three fingers. Next one goes down the middle of these two. Third one goes under the shoulder blade through the elbow into the last three. Which one is it? He says, well, it's got to be this one. Well, you know, sometime during life there can be an injury that tears loose those connective tissues and all those little bones together. You guys follow this? Yeah. Right? So I just put a worm on that hook and I just reel it <laughs> Now that seems to work better than if I try to talk any intelligence. Now I've been in chiropractic long enough and I'm the guy that went to chiropractic school at age 17. Because a chiropractor said there's a power life inside the human body that stops when you die, the spine gets out of line, it limits the power, and people get sick, and you correct the spine, and they come back to life. And I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I got that at 17. <laughs> it just, but that's what we do. That's, that's where most of us live, is, is restoring life. It's bringing life back to a body that doesn't have as much life as it had. It's not a whole lot more complex than that. So if I were to talk about God and life force and chiropractic, we could all get into that, right? But I'm going to shift that just a little bit for you because of what? Majority consciousness sitting over here. Remember that? This is that thing where people can agree in certain ways about what's going on in the world. Now, the good news is our culture is on, is on an edge. It's kind of on a razor's edge. And there's an opportunity here for all of us to be able to see what that edge is and to be able to allow people to make that transformation to the other side. But here's the edge. Healthcare today in America is not working, right? It's just not working. Nobody's happy. Doctors aren't happy, the patients aren't happy. I don't talk to anybody that comes into my practice from any other healthcare provider that's happy. You know? And so, I mean, we get rave reviews because of the way we set it up to take care of people, but that's a whole other issue. But because that unhappiness is out there, there's a way that if we can effectively do this, we can make that shift. But before I go to the shift, I want to go in a little bit deeper on chiropractic philosophy. All of us have an educated, and all of us have an innate, right? I mean, most people in this room have got that part down. Any disagreement with that, that we have an educated and an innate? Okay, so here's the way you need to present that in your culture. All of psychology and psychotherapy today is on the educated side. None of it is on the innate side. There's just a couple of groups within psychotherapy, the transpersonal people happen to be out here in the Bay Area, are saying that the spiritual state is our natural state, and why aren't we living in it? And guess what? When you've got this distortion in your body, and it's compromising your nervous system, it is much harder to get into that state. It's not as easy. When that nervous system is clear and you have cognitive, emotional, and sensory lined up and opened up, it's much easier to integrate into your innate. It is. And you will see it in your patients when you make corrections on spinal misalignments that open up that central nervous system. Not just the nerve into the shoulder and down the outside of the arm, 
but opening up the central nervous system changes someone's life. They've been living with that limitation however long that spine's been misaligned. And they can actually live without it. Now I'm realistic as well. So I'm going to say this, everybody in this room needs to hear it, that a spine that has never been injured and misaligned and corrected is still better than one that's been injured, misaligned and corrected. The difference is, if it's misaligned and the central nervous system is compromised, there is less life in that human being. Whatever the symptomatic picture is. You know, I was not long ago thinking, well, you know, I've been taking care of a lot of lower back and sciatica and maybe some ridiculous things as well. I said, man, I'd like to have something a little different. But you know what showed up the next week? I get a case of dystonia, right? But you know what dystonia is, where your head won't stop shaking, right? Then I get a migraine case, then I get an ADHD on a 10-year-old. It's like, bam, bam, bam. I'm, so I'm getting all of these cases now that are no longer structural and ridiculous pain. Because I open myself to that possibility. But I'm going to go back to educated NA for just a moment. I'm going to say it in a way that you can communicate to the people in your practice. I'm a human being having a spiritual experience and a spiritual being having a human experience. Simple enough. I am a spiritual being having a human experience and a human being having a spiritual experience. Right? And there's an interface between the two. Now, guess what? If you really want to be successful in life, and this is the tough part, I have to put my educator in second position. It's an interesting concept, isn't it? That the little guy, the big guy, needs to be in second position. Now, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. I'm one of those people that believes we need to be developed internally as well as externally. So don't get me wrong about that. I'm the guy that's taken 42 different technique courses. Don't get me wrong about that. But it also needs to be a heart with a mind of its own, not a mind with a heart of its own. And however you need to say that to the people you take care of, the opportunity you have to integrate what we do into people's lives is going to be in that frame. It's going to be bigger than taking care of their symptom. And here's the bad news. They're all going to come in to your practice with a symptom. There's nobody going to come in and say, but you could reconnect me with my NAP. <laughs> right? Now, <clears throat> I've been in practice 42 years. I've had two people come in and say, I feel disconnected with your reading. 25,000 patients, I've only had two. Not a big market. <laughs> Stay on that one. Okay? But what happens is you can watch people develop through stages. And when I first saw these stages developing, when I was asking patients if they had any questions, stage one is this, faith. Where somebody that comes into my practice either believes in me or doubts me. Same stage, right? Do you know what you do when somebody is in a faith stage? You give them permission to be who they 